My name is Goran Vojančić and I'm not, uh, I cannot uh, be uh, brave enough to flatter myself that I'm a dialogue worker, dialogue uh, facilitator, dialogue, uh, not the, especially not the dialogue expert because I hate that word. Uh, but I can uh, say to, about myself that I'm a storyteller, which makes me a half of a dialogue person. Whether I'm a dia person or logos person, I haven't decided yet. But I will uh, end. Uh, I will end up with the in dialogue with myself, and uh, I will come out uh, with uh, eventually with uh, with a conclusion. Uh, I know that. Uh, Stanley said something about we, we haven't met actually for the first time. Uh, he lied. Uh, he, he said we met in uh, in a dialogue seminar in, uh, in May '98. We didn't. We met for the first time in February '1998. He made a lecture on Americanization of the of the Europe in uh, in uh, in library in library, national library. In, in national library in Pristina. And I was there listening to this uh, to this lecture, uh, but the real stuff started in May, actually, because from that lecture of Americanization, I, I only remember that uh, this is those ten thousand cows that uh, that the owners called Alexis due to this uh, dynasty television show. Uh, when when you think about how you uh, end up doing something like this, uh, I I have a many. Uh, but don't tell this to anybody, you know, because when, when they ask me, I always, I'm always trying to come up with some intelligent question, some big, uh, some big story about how I always wanted uh, uh, to do this thing and how it is uh, some kind of a duty for each and every one of us to uh, to make a better world and all this this kind of stuff. But the, the truth is that uh, I ended up doing this job as an accident. I was invited for the first. Uh, for the first seminar, because my command of English language was not that bad. It was very uh, rare that it was good enough uh, with, uh, with Kosovo Serbs. I was one of the few people that actually could listen and talk in English. And that's why they invited me. Uh, I didn't want to go. I had a cozy life. Uh, and uh, I was thinking uh, all the time about me uh, sitting in, in a cabinet, reading and writing, and uh, that should be uh, my life, some, somewhere between uh, academic and wannabe academic. Uh, and I never actually wanted to come in the first place, but, uh, the, but the woman who invited me was very persuasive. So I came and I met this guy, and it was 16 years ago. And uh, two years ago, our project ended in Buenos Aires, and I've tried to do something else after 15 years of work with, uh, with this fisherman here and being a fisherman's friend. Uh, and I realized I couldn't. So be beware of your dialogue career, because it's so inviting that at one, at one moment you will simply uh, step into the area of no return and that would be it when it comes to your other careers. <coughs> I'm, I'm thinking about telling you four stories, public stories, of whom each story will come out one particular issue that I want to explain. This particular story, the bus story, is a story that Steiner for some reason likes very much. I don't, because I remember how I felt when the story was taking place. It is a story uh, that uh, will come, out, come up with uh, some discussion on uh, how much do you plan and how much you can rely on your planning. We had a group of politicians in southern Serbia, and uh, in, uh, in that particular area, we uh, worked on creating, and we actually successfully worked on creating a multi-ethnic government in uh, between Serbs and Albanians in, in uh, one town in South East Serbia. So we, we invited politicians from all these different political parties, and we were supposed to travel to uh, one spa resort in Serbia for a seminar. And the people were coming on the bus station, 
somebody sitting in the, in the bus, somebody uh, standing outside smoking. Everybody is smoking in uh, in uh, in Balkans. Uh, and we were waiting for all participants to come. So when all participants came, of well, 20 of them, and this is also the number that you may want to remember, 20 is uh, around the number that you want to have, 20 participants. Because the, the group is big enough that you can do uh, all these group works and exercises and everything with them, but it's also small enough so that you can actually make some kind of an individual relationship with each member of the group. Because when you have 40, like 40, 50 people, there is not much you can do. You don't. It, it takes some time even to remember the 50 names. Uh, so 19 of them went into the bus, and this 20th guy, he just uh, stood back, and his uh, and the colleague of mine, he looked at him and he said, "I mean, come on, <laughs> we are going." And he said, "No, no, I'm not going." What do you mean you're not going? You came from your house, which is three and a half kilometers away, to the bus station. You were waited. You came among the first. You waited for everybody to show up. And now when everybody is going, you're not going. And he said, well, I never planned to go. I said, but why did you come? <laughs> uh, I wanted to, uh, to be sure that nobody will take my place. He understood this as a, some kind of a political struggle. And in that political struggle, he wanted uh, his political party, if not uh, to be represented because he didn't want to come, then that nobody else uh, should come in his place. So he invested in trying to block uh, the relationship between our project and his political party, uh, trying to block dialogue at the end of the day. This first sentence, can you see this on the... Yeah. That first sentence, actually, I borrowed from the art book, from aesthetics, uh, from two uh, authors. Uh, that I read this book, and at one moment, uh, uh, the authors uh, wrote that dialogue is interruption of monologue. And I immediately reacted, and I said, it cannot be dialogue. This is the most important thing in the, in the world. It cannot be just an interruption of monologue. But they didn't value it, actually. They just lined up in time, monologue and, and dialogue. Their idea, and that's a very interesting idea, is uh, that uh, your first option when you communicate is monologue. Because monologue is addressing uh, uh, some basic needs you have. The, the need to, uh, for predictability, for stability, for safety and security. Because you think when you while you uh, are controlling uh, your, uh, the whole situation through your words, through your monologue, which is uh, uh, covering the, the entire area, you are in control of the situation. And it's a very okay uh, to feel like that. And we all do that. I mean, I obviously prepared uh, this presentation. Actually, I prepared a big presentation, but then I prepared this as a, <laughs> as a train. I'm joking. I obviously prepared this presentation before I came here because you can see it in uh, uh, I took some time to, uh, uh, to, to make PowerPoint. And, uh, and trust me, I had three, sen three first sentences before I went into the room because it helped me. When I have three th sentences that I know what I'm going to say, then uh, it's easier for me to, uh, to come in smoothly into the group and, and, uh, and continue the discussion. And it lasts for some time. As long as you're not interrupted, you will continue with your monologue. You can be interrupted, whether by the other, uh, other person or outside the, outside the, uh, any outside thing, or you can be interrupted by your brain, sharing dilemmas about what you're saying. And then your brain will say, okay, Goran, we know each other for such a long time. And uh, I tell you, maybe you will want to have double thoughts about, about these particular things. The moment it, that happens, you enter into the, uh, into the process of dialogue. The moment you enter the process of dialogue, you cannot control it by definition. Because you're not the only one there. There's somebody else taking the space and sharing this, this space with you. Whatever that somebody else is going to do or say or how it uh, participate, you don't know. You can guess in advance, but you don't know. You never know. So at that moment, 
you come to the what I call terra incognita to some actually not me, it's the Latin, it's the Latin called terra incognita, to some unknown land which is fertile for sure, but you never know what is going to grow on that land. And that's, that's one of the beauties of dialogue, because you're growing this, these things together. How it reflects to, to planning, you have to plan everything down to the last detail. That is my experience. But you also have to uh, understand that uh, that your whole plan can go uh, can go down the drain in less than five minutes. So what do you do when it happens? Do you adjust, or you say we will come later to this, which many facilitators are using this in this phrase, and then forget uh, to come back, but go back to the to the original planning which is okay, but it is going back from the dialogue to, to, to the monologue. It is going back, this violation of the dialogue process. So uh, feel free uh, to step out and trust your participants, trust, uh, trust your partners in dialogue, uh, because they will always come out with something valuable. Uh, don't uh, stick too much to the plans, because, but you have to make it, you have to make all the plans that uh, 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 that you need, but don't be afraid if plans do, uh, don't work. <coughs> Can you start? I, I wrote. Uh, sorry, there is no joy. Can you put it back? There is no joy in giving up on plans unless you didn't plan thoroughly in the first place. I mean, <laughs> you you want to be brave. You say I gave up on my plans and I spent 15 days of planning. Okay. <coughs> Uh, in the course of our work in, uh, in southern Serbia, uh, we were focused on the Serbian-Albanian relationship, because the, the, there are two major ethnic groups. But we quickly realized that there is the third ethnic group uh, there that actually can shift the balance of power. They, can, they have enough votes uh, if, they use, if they use them to, uh, uh, to go in and to take away majority from both of the ethnic groups. And we, uh, we understood this as some kind of, a, some kind of asset that you could use. <coughs> and this was the Roma, Roma group. The problem with Roma group throughout the Europe is that uh, uh, all countries in Europe have only one thing in common. They discriminate Roma people. It is everywhere. It's from Scandinavia, uh, Norway, down to the to the last Balkan, uh, Balkan countries. So by, by living in this, inside this discrimination, they developed certain, uh, certain habits that, uh, that were preventing them to organize politically in, uh, in a sta stable and one political force that can actually uh, take out everything that they deserve by numbers, by, simply by numbers. Uh, and we wanted to explore whether it is possible to work with them and uh, trying to find one uh, uh, trying to develop one uh, strong political force that uh, can make a difference. But, uh, these people are discriminated, they're complaining uh, all the time, and it's very easy to sympathize with them. You know, so a lot of people are doing this, a lot of people are sympathizing with them. They gather in the, in the rooms like this and they cry together. And uh, they cry together for the entire project, then they uh, some this drama continue to cry. Uh, the others uh, write in reports. They separate, and that's it. <coughs> so uh, I was traveling from my first uh, from my first seminar down to to Macedonia, uh, which is like six seven hours trip. And I was thinking, how how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? They've been in many different seminars, and uh, nothing ever came out from this. And I've heard uh, dreadful stories about, uh, actually it was the, the deputy mayor in Buenovac, it's a town in South Serbia, who called me for a meeting and he uh, specifically told me, you have developed a certain credibility in this town, don't spend it on Roma because you're going to fail. This is what he actually told me in these words. Uh, and that, that, that's one of the reasons, because I'm a, I'm a stubborn bastard, that's, <laughs> that's when I decided that I should do it anyway. 
so I was thinking that maybe, maybe the good approach would be uh, that uh, I should uh, uh, simply come there and say, I'm not going to sympathize with you. I don't care about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, any sympathies. I know that it, it is very valuable human, uh, uh, human uh, condition and, uh, and uh, human <coughs> strength to sympathize with others. Uh, but nothing came out from this anyway. So maybe if we uh, just sit down together and try to change it, it would be a better option. We, we have spent three and a half years together. Uh, after three and a half years, they formed a political party. They won two, two seats in the local self government for the first time that any Roma political party, in my, in my knowledge, that any Roma political party ever did by simply participating in elections. Not, uh, nobody gave them this. They formed the party and listened. What happened in the meantime, actually, uh, that uh, I gave up on being a tough bastard on that. I gave up. Uh, I developed a certain uh, emotions to them, but uh, uh, emotions that uh, was far beyond uh, this sympathetic emotion. So I was thinking, how come it, uh, actually it was Steiner who told me uh, this may be the, the best thing that you, you told me once, do you remember this? It is the, maybe the best thing that you will ever do. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, what happened? How did I develop this, uh, this relationship uh, with them? <coughs> and then I realized that, uh, that in dialogue, uh, you cannot be the third party. What does it mean? in the first place. What are the first two parties? Who is the first party? Do we only have two parties in conflict or more? Very rarely you have two. So, you, in that sense you cannot be third. But what, in what sense you can be third? Uh, maybe it's the first party that is outside, but how can you be outside? So then I realized that, uh, that all these notions about impartiality, neutrality, standing outside, being the third party, are just simply rubbish. Because, and, uh, and I developed this sentence, that if, if in something you're intellectually engaged, you're emotionally involved, and you're physically present, you, you are participating. That's a simple logic. It has nothing to do with dialogue, with uh, uh, human <laughs> relations, with uh, peace building, with this and that. No. It has to do with the simple, simple logic. You simply participate. When you participate, you are in dialogue. When you participate in dialogue, you are in dialogue with, uh, with your participants. So in, in a sense, you are kind of developing this, uh, this relationship. And it, it gives you credibility and trust that you later can use in, uh, in a recruitment process. Because at one point, uh, with this trust, you can recruit difficult participants. Slowly, slowly but surely. But, uh, it, uh, in most of the cases, you won't get the difficult participants at the beginning, so that's a hooray, that's a good, that's a good news for you. But uh, at the end of the day, if you want to make some, some kind of a bigger change, you need to work with, uh, with uh, people who are uh, ideological, not your friends. Uh, but I will, not, uh, I will not continue this because uh, of the time. We had the uh, ICMP is a shortcut for uh, International Committee for Missing Persons. Uh, I've been involved for two and a half years in working with the uh, association of families of people who were kidnapped and uh, allegedly killed uh, during the war. And uh, uh, I was working for two years with them uh, uh, with, with the Serbian uh, because as, as you can probably imagine, is that uh, people are dividing on everything in divided societies. They inclu they, uh, that included also division on, uh, on victims. <laughs> you know, so the Serbs organized the Serbian Association of Families uh, of Victims, and the Albanian have obviously their, their own. So I was working for two years with the Serbian organizations, and my colleague Abdullah was working with, with an Albanian. <coughs> and at one point, after two years, we decided to bring them here in the school and try to use this gentleman here to uh, to 
do some joint stuff. And it's very difficult to bring these people together because for, uh, for all the misery they uh, encountered and experienced in life, they blame the other side. And this is the misery. This is a very big thing because uh, I learned from this group that actually they took the part of my heart and changed it with something else. Uh, that I barely recognize, but uh, I think that has a better quality than uh, than this part of my heart that they take, they, they take it. This is one of the most difficult groups I've been working with. Uh, but these people, in a sense, they uh, it's very difficult to move them. Uh, they're so bitter, they're so angry, they're so locked in uh, in this uh, in this life they have that they simply don't see how they don't even go out for drinks. They say, I will not go out for, how can I go out for drink when, uh, when I didn't find my son or my daughter? Or so. and, th and there was a guy who lost 32 members of his family in that group during the war. <coughs> so you can imagine <laughs> that it was a little bit difficult to work with them uh, here. And we were working slowly, you know, kind of, uh, it's one of those seminars where you, uh, if you make a mistake, uh, you made a mistake and that's it. You just give up on, on the group. So we were very slow, for two, two and a half days, and the third day we traveled to Oslo <coughs> with a minibus, we traveled to Oslo to meet some uh, organizations like Red Cross, Norwegian Foreign Ministry people. We ended up in a beautiful dinner with one of the uh, prominent uh, Norwegian uh, peace worker, and uh, we started to drive back home. Uh, it was late night, uh, winter. Uh, <coughs> and it was, it was kind of a, you know, one of those Norwegian winter nights. You Norwegians know what, I, what I'm talking about. Somewhere between Eidsvoll and Hamad. No light, nothing. It's complete silence in, in the bus we were, we were driving. And uh, it's one of those nights when you, when you can easily believe that the whole world is inside that bus. That, that there's nothing outside. So dark and so and so calm. And at one moment, uh, at one moment, a woman from the group started to laugh. And now that came as a surprise, because they never laugh. Uh, but yet she was laughing, and it's a big woman. Uh, it's a young and strong and big woman, and her laughter is coming like uh, like an avalanche. And it's one of those laughs when you can't, that you can't resist. You simply have to join, you know. So, uh, so we did. The another, uh, uh, her friend started to, to laugh as well. And then the guy sitting in front of them. And it spread, it spread it through the bus. And suddenly we found ourselves laughing to death, except Steiner, who was actually uh, calling Vesna because he, uh, his, he was calling his wife, because if, he, if she, somebody out from the bus did, didn't hear this, nobody would believe us. They were laughing from Hammer to Hammer, which is an hour and a ten minutes drive, all the way through. And we went out from the bus and I said, what was this? And he said, it's a ten years long, uh, old laughter. When we, that, that was late night. When we came back tomorrow in the room, the atmosphere was completely different. They started to cooperate. They realized in a sense, that they started to talk, to discuss. They realized in the sense that, uh, that they're victims of the same logic, of the same gun, but fired with a different finger. And... Uh, and the rest of the seminar was very, very easy. Uh, they almost ran it by themselves. And uh, they started to cooperate, to help each other, because uh, one, uh, Albanian groups live in Kosovo and the Serbian groups live in uh, Serbia, and it's very difficult in crisscross to, to uh, get to the governmental bodies. So they were helping each other, trying to find each other. As far as I know, they're still cooperating. And Stan may add uh, later something, they still, re still remember this seminar. What I'm trying to say, which is relevant for this story, is that you cannot intellectualize everything. 
something, the things will happen that you will have to wait. And uh, you need the character to recognize when this thing, this one was easy to, uh, to recognize, obviously. But there are some other uh, moments with some other groups that were not that easy. But you have to be there all the time to recognize when this moment comes, because it's one of these crucial moments. It's a moment when everything cracks down and, and the new logic starts to prevail in, in the room. But also out of the room, which is uh, uh, another thing that we have learned uh, from this is that you don't expect dialogue to happen only in the room. Part of the dialogue happens outside of the room. And it happens all the time. So when you say, I will, uh, I will work with this group for three days, it means three days, 24 hours, every day. You have to know this. <coughs> uh, the uh, question of all questions, a very old one. What, what do you do with ex, uh, extremists? What do you do with difficult participants? Me being one of them. <laughs> Is, uh, we, have, uh, we have most of the political parties <coughs> in, this, in this project in southern, southern Serbia. We had a lot of different political parties, but we didn't have the most radical ones. Uh, we invited them, uh, but they said uh, they, they wouldn't come because we are traitors, we are, we are international. Uh, Bastards, we are, you know, whatever you, uh, you, you've heard many. You, I, I know you heard a lot, of, a lot, a lot of these things in your work. Uh, and we said, okay, we didn't insist. We uh, continued our work, uh, but we said the invitation is open uh, for you. After four years, uh, everybody came to participate. Uh, one political party, which is extremely radical right-wing Serbia political party, uh, they uh, uh, asked for their headquarters in Belgrade to change their statute, because in their statute it was written that they uh, will not cooperate with the international organization. So they called and said, this, this international organization, we want to cooperate. So you have to make an excuse, and they did in the party documentation, so that they can legally <laughs> come, come to participate. Uh, this guy, I was talking to this guy who, who is the head of this political party. We have nothing in common, and he knew that. I'm the leftist. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the leftist and I'm Aristotelian. I think that uh, there are no uh, divisions between people, only, di only differences. And he's a right-wing uh, Serbian politician, very <laughs> kind of half fascist, but very racist, very nation nationalistic, and all this kind of stuff. But yet, he, yet they came. He came himself, and he participated on many issues. Where, uh, they didn't touch with their Albanian counterparts. They didn't touch some of the issues that they obviously they knew. In, uh, you have to trust participants. They were intelligent enough to know that that the, that they wouldn't agree on this, not at this stage. But there are some other things that they could agree, and they have discussed it uh, very often. So, uh, well, what, what I'm trying to say is that you have to be there for everybody. Some may use it, some may not. Uh, but uh, you have to give option to everybody, because if dialogue is about to change, that option should be given to everybody. You never know. These uh, people are changing through, uh, through this process. And uh, I'm sorry that Conrad is not here because I wanted to make a joke on his account. And I wrote here that dialogue can maybe create a fatigue, but it is absence of dialogue that creates misery. And this is what I believe that uh, dialogue is, uh, is really nothing more than the air. You know, like air, we are all breathing, we don't think about, uh, about the air. We, we breathe uh, normally. It's like the, we have a community dialogue and social dialogue normally. But when uh, somebody takes away the air from us, we are choking and we are dying. The same goes with dialogue. You can, you, can, uh, you can see the dialogue is not there only in its absence. 
sometimes it's too late when you notice this. And this is uh, okay. Understand? We are speed trying to speed up the process. Okay, this uh, and this is my last uh, last story that I want to share with you. And uh, this is the story of all stories. <laughs> the stories I called stories I would like to forget, if only I could, which I couldn't. <laughs> uh, this group, I'm coming again to this particular group of uh, families of this kidnapped person. Uh, we ended up the seminar after seven days, and uh, we have this uh, tradition to give the to give the diplomas, uh, like certificates. You know, you have participated in the seminar, blah blah. So the part of the tradition is that uh, Steiner is handing over the certificates, and uh, the person who is handed over uh, will come and take the <coughs> say thank you to Steiner and, and say a few words, and then go back with the certificate to to his or her place. Uh, at one moment, the woman came out and uh, she, she took the certificate, she turned to the Albanian woman from Kachin, which is a town in the south, southern part of Kosovo, and uh, she said, before this thing happened to me, this thing meaning uh, some Serbian uh, paramilitary killed her 17 years old daughter, husband and father-in-law in her own eyes leaving her alive because one of them uh, said uh, uh, we should leave her uh, we should let her live it will be more difficult to her than to be killed and she said before this thing happened to me i was taught that uh, that all people are the same and that was my life i, I was taught by my parents that there are no differences between serbs and Albanians and roman bosnians and Croats, whoever but that the only difference is between good and bad people. When this thing happened to me, uh, I changed this opinion. And I started to hate all Serbs, not only those Serbs who did this to me, but all of them. All the time, she said, I knew that I was not right. I knew that it wasn't me. I knew that it wasn't my life. But I couldn't help myself. And then, she, and then I came to this seminar, and then she turned to us and she said, so guys, thank you for giving me my life back. If you ever have a, <laughs> if I ever had a dilemma about the work that you're doing, that moment this dilemma disappeared completely. Uh, you're doing a job that uh, not many jobs in open market can match because of the reward. The re reward you get in this job is something that will that you will have to keep in your hearts for the rainy days because you will have bad participants, you will have bastards in seminars, uh, everything will happen, your equipment will not work, the weather is going to be either too nice outside, so the people will disappear, either too bad outside, so the people will be cranky. A lot of things can happen in Dallas, especially if you remember when I said that you cannot control it. You have to live through it. You have to participate in it. But keep this in your heart for these rainy days, for these moments when things don't work. Try to remind yourself that you're doing the job that is very difficult to be matched with any job in the world because the reward is so big that uh, it's very difficult even to measure it. Yeah. So have trust in your participants and then uh, you can join me here and have many beautiful stories to tell. Thank you very much. Thank you.